Everybody, if you would, turn in your songbooks to 519. 519. <clears throat> We're going to sing the first verse. Let's sing. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Excited. I know you guys are as well. <clears throat> excited for Rich Shockley being here. Uh, probably most of you know who Rich is, but uh, if you don't, Rich is the son of James and Shirley Shockley, and he is the preacher at Rockbridge uh, Church of Christ. Um, he is going to begin to walk us through some things in these lessons, uh, and he'll probably elaborate a little more on that, are building blocks. They're going to build on each other, these lessons. So he wanted me to open up this morning with a scripture from Psalm 18, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. Psalm 18, verses 1 through 3. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. And my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Let's go to God in prayer. Our most holy and precious God, you are worthy to be praised. We thank you for another Lord's Day where we can come and study your word and worship you, Lord. We thank you for this congregation here at Fountainhead and, and let us strive to do your will, Lord, in all, in all things, the, the way we act, the way we help, the way that we be in the community. Let us be an example for you and let us show people what your children look like. Lord, we thank you for Rich and his abilities. Lord, be with him today as he brings us some lessons. Be with him this week, Lord. Just keep him refreshed and keep his mind clear and open. And Lord, we, we again thank you for his willingness to preach your word. What an encouragement it is to us and so many others. Be with us now in this hour, Lord, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> How's that? All right. Good to see everybody this morning. Appreciate you being here. Boy, I am excited for this week. I cannot tell you how much I have looked forward to being with you this week. Uh, Matt and I have spent quite a bit of time. You know, one of the, the beauties of our uh, friendship and our relationship is that uh, we've spent quite a bit of time uh, kind of talking through some things, but especially spending some time in prayer about this week. And so I'm very excited to be with you and to share these things with you. I, I just, I cannot tell you enough. I know, um, you know, this, this, is a, this is like a, a homecoming for me. Uh, I have been around and in this congregation since I was very, very young. In fact, I was you know, I was, I, I was one of those annoying little kids that kind of ran around when, when we'd visit from up north because we, we grew up up there, I grew up up there. We'd come down and I just remember just kind of running around and, you know, kicking people in the shins and stuff like that. You know, I mean, I was one of those kids. So, uh, you know, but I, it's so great to be able to be here and to share God's word with you this week. Uh, I appreciate Matt so much. I appreciate the elders of this congregation so much. And all the work that you all are doing for this community uh, to spread the word of Christ and to share the gospel with everyone that you're, you're around. 
I think it's so important, and I think that, that there is a strong sense of the power of God and His Spirit uh, with this congregation, and so it's very exciting for me to be here. Well, as you can see on the slides, and we'll have some slides for our class this morning or for our time this morning, uh, we're going to be talking about the building stones of faith this week. Uh, these are foundational lessons about God's covenant. And one of the things that I hope that you'll find as we get into uh, this lesson or get into this series of lessons is that each one is going to build on itself. And we're, we're kind of working up to a culmination to the final lesson uh, that we're going to have on Wednesday night. So I hope that you see that as we go through each and every one. So uh, there's a, a little bit of a double meaning with this idea of these foundational lessons in that we begin with a base, we begin with that foundation, and we're going to build on that as we go through the week and what God's Word has to say to us about that. I want to I begin, go ahead and turn your Bibles, if, uh, if you would, to uh, Matthew chapter 22, and we're going to get to that here in just a moment. Matthew chapter 22. <clears throat> and then I got one more thing that I want to share with you. One of the things that I, I kind of wanted to do something a little bit different this week, because I'm a little bit different, so I thought I'd do something a little, little odd, maybe a little off kilter a bit, but I hope that we have both some fun with it, but also something that uh, is uh, just enjoyable. And, and it's that uh, I've got this, you can't see this, I know, from, from where you're at, but I've got this, uh, this scripture stone. It's, uh, you can see, you know, about how big it is. Um, I've got 10 of these hidden throughout the building. You guys like Easter egg hunts? This is a scripture stone hunt. And so, so throughout the week, I got 10 of these hidden throughout the building. Now, you may have already run across one, and you go, oh, I wondered what that was. That's what that is. If you find one, you can keep it. How about that? Does that sound like a pretty good deal? If you find one, you can keep it. Everyone's got a different scripture on it. And it just kind of goes along with our theme this week of the stones of faith, right? The building blocks of God's covenant. So you're going to find these. Hopefully you'll find them. But you only get one now. So, so if you find another one, if you find two, don't go, well, hey, I got the bonus. You know, I mean, just leave it, leave it there. And if, you know, and don't tell anybody where it's at. Just keep it to yourself and, and let everybody find them. We'll see. If, and if you find one... If you don't mind, tell me. Let me know, because uh, otherwise in six months, somebody may come up and go, hey, I found about three or four of those stones just kind of, you know, just sitting around. Is that, a, you know, that sort of thing. I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to find them all before the week's over, so, uh, or before our time is up uh, on Wednesday. So be looking for those, and we'll mention that again during, uh, during our service uh, this, uh, this morning. Well, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about the building stones of faith for just a minute. And do a little bit of, we'll do a little bit of intro here and then we'll get into the meat of our, our lesson together this morning. You know, rocks and stones play a very important role in our lives, a lot more than I think we realize. Uh, from the foundational bedrock that we build on, you know, that's one of the reasons we're able to, to build our homes and build our businesses and stuff because there's, there's foundational bedrock underneath what we see that we can build on those things to things as simple as a skipping stone. Uh, how many of you like to skip stones? Yeah? Just a few people, really. Boy, y'all need to get out more. Um, I love skipping stones. I don't, I don't get to do it very often, and I'm not as good at it as, it as I used to be, but uh, I remember, in fact, my dad was the one who taught me how to, how to skip stones. I can remember learning that, and, 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 and it's still, you know, it's still fascinating to me if you can take a, st a stone and skip it along the water, and you kind of, you know, generate fun memories with something like that, all the way to the point to where we even use stones, right, tombstones, in which when we pass from this earth, we put up a stone that, that memorializes the, the loved one or, or our lives. And, and sometimes we etch things into those stones that, that say something about that person. We want to memorialize them. We want to we share that with the world. So stone, stones play actually a, a pretty important role in our lives, more so sometimes than we realize. And obviously this is just three of many examples that we could cite in our series this week on the building stones of faith, we're actually going to look at six key instances of how God uses stones or rocks to convey his word, his 
covenant, his will for mankind to know him, to follow him, and to find salvation in him through Jesus Christ. And so I, I want us, as we, as we think about these, to see how it is that God uses these sort of ordinary creation, in a sense, for extraordinary means and for an extraordinary purpose. We're going to begin this series this morning with the stones of the covenant. And that's why I want to begin here in Matthew chapter 22. And we're going to look at verses 34 through 40 here in this uh, this passage just to kind of get us started off. Beginning in verse 34, Matthew writes and records for us that when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, talking about Jesus, of course, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Very simple question, a question that obviously was sort of, I think, meant to trap Jesus in some way. I don't know necessarily what he was getting at other than asking this question and maybe trying to paint him or get him to paint himself into a corner. But here you have Jesus answering the question, maybe in a way in which this lawyer wasn't really anticipating. So he asked this question, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And you'll note that Jesus says two things. The first is this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Jesus is reiterating, of course, that Shema, right? That that prayer from Deuteronomy, the, the idea of loving God first in every aspect of your life, in every part of your being, your heart, your soul, and your mind. But then he also says this, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's this beautiful summary, really, of the Ten Commandments. The sort of ten firsts, the basics, if you will, of what God intended for our lives and how we should live. And that is exactly where we're going to start with the Ten Commandments, written upon stones written by God's own hand, according to Exodus 31, carried in the Ark of the Covenant for Israel to follow. These are the words that were written upon those stones that represented God's core covenant that would see their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. So let's jump back and look at Exodus 20 this morning. That's where we're going to set up camp there, really, and spend the most of our time in Exodus 20. Let's take a look at that together. <clears throat> Exodus 20 is, for all intents and purposes, you know, when you, when you sign a, a contract or when you, you come together in an agreement between two people, there are usually terms to that contract. In a way, Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments are the terms of the covenant. God coming to his people and saying, look, these are the basic fundamentals. In in fact, everything else stems off of these 10. And we're going to examine these closer this morning as we look at this sort of first big instance in Scripture in which God uses stones to convey his covenant with man. Now, we have the first four. The first four really answers the question of who is God And why should we worship him only? So let's break these down. I want to look at each of these. And we're going to spend a little bit of time with each of the ten. The first is this. Who should we worship or who we should worship? Look with me in Exodus chapter 20 in the first three verses of this chapter. Notice what's going on. Notice what God conveys. We're told in verse 1, God spoke all these words saying... I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
The first commandment is answering really who is God and why we should worship him only. Who should we worship? Well, there's a reason why God is laying these out. This isn't just God saying, well, you know, if I don't put this down in, in, in some kind of written form, uh, this thing, you know, could be a disaster. God is, is trying very much to relay to his people what it is that he wants them to remember. Israel, you have to remember, Israel's heading towards the promised land. And if you, if you don't recall, the land, the promised land of Canaan is a pagan land. It's not his land yet, right? It's not theirs yet. And so he's going to give it over to them. And they're heading, so they're heading towards this land. And God wants them, as they're getting ready to go in, to remember who should they worship. Deuteronomy, if you look at the writing of Deuteronomy, there's heavy influence uh, on this, on this particular, excuse me, subject of who we should worship. God knew that it was easy for them to be swayed. It was easy for them to be seduced. And if they didn't remember who had freed them, if they didn't remember who had saved them, did you notice before he even got to the very first one, notice again what it says in verse 2. I am the Lord your God. Hey, remember me? This is sort of God saying this. Remember me? I'm the Lord your God, the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the one who brought you out of the house of slavery. I'm the one who saved you. You should have no other gods before me. No one else should be a priority in your life. And so he presents this first one in saying, I'm the who you should worship. Our priority as Christians today is no different. We are to remember God. We're to remember Jehovah. We're to remember the most high God who through Christ saved us. Who through Christ freed us from our sin slavery. Isn't that good news? And so as we think about what it is and who it is we should be worshiping, this stands as a reminder to us, just as it did to them, about who they should be worshiping. But then he goes on to talk about how they should worship. And this is verses 4 through 6. Let's look at this together. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. It's tempting. In our lives, as I think it was for them, and this is why God lays this out. It's tempting sometimes in our lives to worship the image of God or something else as God rather than God Himself. We know this to be true. Just look at our lives. Look at the way in which we we live our lives sometimes, the things that are at the center point of our lives. Sometimes we, we may worship the image of God or something else as God rather than God himself. If you just kind of keep your finger there in Exodus 20, turn over just a few chapters to Exodus 32. Exodus 32. <clears throat> Do you remember the golden calf? This is a pivotal moment in the lives of God's people. We're told in this particular passage at the beginning of, of chapter 32 of Exodus that the, the people were looking for Moses. He had been up on the mountain and, and he hadn't come down yet. And notice what it says near the end of verse 1. They gathered themselves together to Aaron and they said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. We don't know where he's at. What's going on with Moses? But instead of trying to wait for Moses like they should have, 
They want Aaron to do something for them. They want Aaron to make them gods. So Aaron, we're told in verse 2, says to them, take off your rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, notice what they said, these are your gods, O Israel. These are your gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. This is a dark, this is a dark moment in Israel's life. You have to understand, it was just 40 days or so prior to this that they stood at the base of Mount Sinai, that they were sprinkled with the blood of the covenant, and they said, we will follow the Lord and the Lord only. That God had made this covenant with them. And here they were, just a little over a month later. And here they are saying to Aaron, look, this Moses guy's disappeared. I don't know what's happened to him, but we think that we need a God that we can follow. We need something tangible. Make us a God. In particular, in verse 8, when God is talking to Moses, look at what God says to him. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I have commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf. They've worshipped it. They sacrificed it. They've said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You think God's very happy about this? How do you think he's feeling about this at this moment? Well, we we're told, in fact, aren't we? If you go on in the passage, we're told that God says to Moses, look, I'm going to take care of this. And Moses, in a sense, has to talk him out of it. God wanted to punish them. And Moses comes before him and pleads with him not to do that. Let me go. Let me talk, if you will, to them. Israel had been in captivity for 400 years or so. Actually, a little bit more than that in Egypt. And one of the many gods that they witnessed while they were here, if you've ever wondered why a golden calf, there's actually a good reason. Because while they're in Egypt... One of the many gods, Egyptian gods, that they encountered was a bull. Actually, there were three different bull cults in Egypt that were worshipped. They were big deals in Egypt. And the Egyptians bowed down before these gods. They were considered uh, the, the gods who represented courageous hearts and great strength and fertility and the fighting spirit, spirit of a warrior king. So here you have this moment. Now it sort of makes, I think, you know, I've always kind of wondered about the golden calf. Why did you pick that? It's because they had been exposed for so long in Egypt to this. In fact, later on in Joshua, and we're going to talk about Joshua 24 in our worship time this morning. But did you, did you, catch, you catch a little bit later on in Joshua 24, 14 and 15, that Joshua was looking at Israel and he's saying, you need to leave the gods that your fathers worshipped in Egypt. You know, I, I, I don't think it's too far of a stretch to think that this is one of the gods that they were worshiping. And one of the reasons why they made this golden calf was because they worshiped that God back in Egypt. They had fallen into idolatry. They had walked away from God, and here they are doing it all over again, even though God had freed them. They were worshiping the image of God or gods or whatever they want, however they wanted to categorize it, but it wasn't the one true God. Church, you and I don't bow down before images of God, do we? At least we shouldn't. It's very easy sometimes, I think, in our lives to, to set up things like crosses, I mean, and, 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 and different things like that, different representative images, if you will. But we don't worship those things. We worship God Almighty. We bow down not before the image of the cross, but we bow down before Christ. In our worship sometimes, is it done towards the idea of God, but not God himself? 
When we gather to worship God, are we, are we worshiping towards just an idea, just a thought, just a, an image? Or are we actually worshiping God? Because it's all too easy to know things that reflect God, but not, not really know God. Let's not make that mistake. And this was one of the things that God wanted them to watch out for. It's not only important who we worship, but it's important how we worship. But then jump back with me to Exodus 20. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, a graven image. And then in verse 7... God says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. That word vain just means empty. I think sometimes we do the mistake of reading this passage and we translate it in our heads that it's, well, it's about cursing. Using God's name in a curse. Invoking God's name in that way. But really, it's about invoking God's name in any kind of empty way. The name of God is powerful, church. We have to believe that and we have to be convicted of that idea. The name of God means something. The name of God and its divine nature possesses salvation itself. Look what Acts 4.12 says. This is Jesus. He's the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. How are we saved? In the name of Jesus. That's not just a phrase we use. Sometimes I wonder when we're wrapping up our prayers, in Jesus' name, amen. Seems like we're in a bigger hurry to get to the amen than we are to proclaim that we just prayed in Jesus' name. That means something. When we do something in the name of Jesus, when we do something in the name of God, it's the name in which we find salvation We must not invoke God's name profanely or frivolously or hypocritically. God's name deserves our highest honor, amen? Amen. It deserves our highest honor. I can't stand to see people, even, yes, people in the church who are using God's name, who are using Jesus' name in flippant ways, as if it doesn't matter, as if it's just another name. No, this is the name by which we've been saved. In whose name we worship. God wanted them to be sure. Don't take my name in vain. Don't use it in empty ways. Honor it. And then there's the next one. Honoring God's eternal work. Look with me at verses 8 through 11. God says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The term Sabbath literally means to rest. It's the Hebrew word Shabbat. It literally means to rest or to cease. It doesn't mean Saturday. It doesn't mean seven. It means to rest or to cease We know this because we can go back to Genesis 2 and see how exactly what is being given to them here. We can see exactly what it is that God is talking about in which after that, that creation, how God rested on the seventh day. He was, he was really in a way, he was honoring the work that he had done. 
because it was a powerful work. God instituted the Sabbath as a means to recenter his people upon him, upon his creation, upon each other. Over in Matthew 12, Jesus finds himself in the midst of these Sabbath controversies. Turn over there with me real quick. Let's look at this. Matthew 12. Here at the beginning of chapter 12, you can see, we're told that Jesus, I love this, Jesus and his disciples are going through this grain field on the Sabbath, and we're told that his disciples were hungry, and so what did they do? They reached down and they began to pluck the head of grain and eat it. And I love this in verse 2, we're told that the Pharisees, they see it, and they said to him, look what your disciples are doing. What is, they're doing what is not lawful for them to do on the Sabbath. And he says to them in verse 3, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him to eat, nor for, the pre, uh, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, Something greater is here. Something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Once again, they're trying to trap Jesus, aren't they? They're trying to use the law against him, and Jesus is the very fulfillment of the law, the very manifestation of the the law of God. And so here they are trying to, in in essence, use himself against him. And Jesus is like, no, that ain't going to fly. Because you've completely misunderstood it anyway. You, You treat it as if it's just some sort of legality. It's more than that. It's part of a covenant relationship with God. It's part of a covenant relationship with me. But Jesus doesn't even like, I mean, it's, you come to, to chapter 12 and it's not even that he starts here. You got to go back to chapter 11 to see where he really starts the thought. Back in chapter 11 at the end in verses 30 or 28 through 30, listen to what Jesus says here. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. And what does he say? I will give you rest. What does Sabbath mean? To rest. Jesus is saying, come to me. I am your Sabbath. You don't need some special day set aside. You don't need to worry about the legalities of what is being laid down. You need to come to me. This is why he can say, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. The Sabbath in its manifestation of God himself on earth in the form of Jesus Christ his son is the living, breathing Sabbath. Sabbath isn't about a day. And then it never was. It's about purposeful invitation to God to honor him and his eternal work. I've heard over the years so many times people... People want to argue or they want to, to debate about, well, what's the Christian Sabbath? It's got to be Sunday, right? The fact of the matter is, we have no need to set aside a certain day for Sabbath. We set aside the first day of the week for worship. We follow in the pattern of the New Testament church. We do exactly what the apostles instructed the church to do, and we continue on today. But as far as Sabbath goes, that rest, that ceasing, it's not about a day. It's about those moments in our lives every day when we, with purposeful invitation, come before God and we honor him and we honor his work in our lives, everything from creation to salvation. 
Now, let's talk about the last six. What God values and so should, do, so, should, so should we. Let's go back to Exodus 20. The first is this, value. Val, he values our family. Look at verse 12 of Exodus 20. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Our families are the first intimate relationships in life where we should learn about what life is to live. About love, about compassion, about mercy, about honor, about God and about Christ. Family is intended by God, I believe, to prepare us for deeper relationships and in particular a deeper relationship with God and with Christ. This is why we get so frustrated when we see Society try to chip away or tear away at the family, the fabric of the family. Because we understand that in the family, this is the place in where God delivers us into the first set of hands, into the first set of hearts that are supposed to be there to teach us how to live. God values the family. He always has. And we honor him when we honor our families. Do we value our families the way God values family? But then there's also life. Verse 13. Very plainly, God says, you shall not murder. God values life and he expects us to as well. He expects us to value life as well. Look at how in these recent days, the last 18 months or so, we have fought so hard to protect life. But that's not the only time we do it. Yeah, it was a moment of crisis perhaps, but really every day as Christians, we are are and ought to be fighting for life. The sacredness of the life that God has given to each of us. This is This is why we are so overcome with grief at times when we can't understand people who get upset that we're fighting for the unborn life. As hard as we are fighting for those those of us who are already walking around. Because God values all of it. Over in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, Jesus in that instance, he says, look, Here's the problem. You want to focus on the actual act of taking life, but it begins someplace else. It begins in your heart. If you even look at your brother and in a contemptuous way call him a fool, you've started and gone down the wrong path. You've already begun. You've already begun to devalue life. And then there's marriage. Verse 14 Exodus 20, you shall not commit adultery, a commitment. This is a covenant, not a contract. I had a conversation not that long ago about marriage with someone. And I was saying, you know, part of the problem we have in our society is that we want to talk about marriage as if it's just a contract. I don't know about you, but contracts sometimes we look at and we go, well, that's pretty easy. to be. I can break that. I can find a way to get out of a contract if I need to. I might have to pay a little little fee, a little penalty or something like that, but I can get out of a contract. Marriage isn't a contract. It's a covenant. It's a commitment. God's creation of the marriage bond was a mirror reflection of his desired relationship with man. We see that come to fruition in the New Testament in which Christ tells us that the church is his bride. Adultery is an insidious and destructive force upon a marriage because it treats the covenant with selfish disdain. I don't care that much about you. I don't care that much about this relationship. So I can do what I want to do, when I want to do it, and how I want to do it. Doesn't matter if you get hurt. Well, yes, it does. God said it does. Because God said, no, marriage is a covenant. And you need to honor it as a covenant. And then in verse 15, he talks about honesty. Exodus 20, 15. You shall not steal. Do not steal. Contribute. Don't take what isn't yours. Church, we're supposed to not be consumers. We're supposed to be contributors to this world. We're supposed to be contributing. We're supposed to be putting out there the gospel and God's message in Christ. Stealing is a culmination of a heart that is dishonest, 
with itself thinking that we deserve something more than we already have. Then in verse 16, there's integrity. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This isn't just about lying, by the way. It forbids the lie and condemns the liar. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 tells us to put away lying. But it also tells us something else, to speak truth. We don't just not lie, church. We speak truth. That's the way we're supposed to live. A path of dishonesty compromises one's integrity and credibility. If we're going to attract others to God and Christ, we have to live in such a way that people can trust our word. They can trust us. Are we putting that out there for the world to see? And then finally, there's thankfulness. Verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or his male servant or female servant or his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Coveting is a sin that chips away at the inward man. And then if given into, shows others and often damages them too. Covetousness is the exact opposite of our calling to be content in all circumstances. We ought to be able to be content in Christ. But covetousness says, no, I'm not. I'm not thankful. I'm not content. While contentedness washes over us, producing joy, covetousness consumes us, producing resentment and bitterness. Covetousness says, I'm never going to be satisfied. The covenant never went away. Never went away. It was powerfully fulfilled in Jesus, right? Isn't that what Matthew says? Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Every New Testament writer included these in some form as part of the new covenants directed by God and Christ. Paul reflected the words of Jesus in Matthew 22 and Romans 13, 8, and 8 through 10. Notice what he said. Oh, no one anything except to love each other. And for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. And here we come full circle. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. These precepts are intended... Not just under the new covenant, they were intended under the old. To change our hearts and to bind us to an eternal covenant with our creator. Here's the question I want to leave you with this morning. Do we value a covenant with God as he values with us? Do we value, it started with these stones of the covenant. Do we value that as God values it with us? We're going to continue on in our thoughts. Thank you for your attention this morning. I appreciate it. We'll continue on as we, this morning, are going to take a look at Joshua and the Stone of Witness. We'll get to that here in just a little bit.